and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. Thank you for joining us for another hour of garden advice with our panel of extension experts. You can get in touch with us by dialing 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. We take your questions and your pictures by email for a future show, byf at unl.edu. Attach those pictures as JPEGs. Give us as much information as you can, including where you live, so I don't have to ask you in a follow-up e email. You can get an additional information during the week from our social media offerings. That's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So let's start by looking at samples. Jody, you have a little tower of insects and some I pictures. I kind of put art and science together. But Perfect. I've got, um, I'm going to call these beetles of the garden. So they're pests. Um, we have on this side, we've got the common asparagus beetle. I'm not going to go into too much of what it looks like, but here's a picture. Wow. It's, I call it handsomely beautiful. It's a very <laughs> beautiful adult. The larvae are not very beautiful. They look very slug-like, and they are crawling all over the ferns right now and eating those of asparagus. So that's asparagus beetle. And you can see over here, these are the eggs. If you look really closely, you'll see these eggs are everywhere. The damage that this um, beetle does, it weakens the plant. Sometimes you'll see distortions and bending in the spears. Um, it does overwinter as adults, and so, um, you know, garden cleanup is always important, and um, there's two to three generations a year. Um, one of the things you can do is hand pick. So you can see I hand picked quite a bit, and check in the afternoons when it's sunny. That's when they're most active. Um, and then the ones I have on the right are going to be the bean leaf beetle. Um, they are a bunch of different colors, like they're dark yellow, red, orange, but they've got these black spots that are kind of uh, rectangular. So people think they kind of look like ladybugs, but mm -hmm. these will destroy your beans. So they'll start looking like, like sorry, this. So they kind of look like doilies. Um, they're kind of tricky though, because if you try to get close to them, they'll play dead and fall off the, the plant. So one of the things you can do, well, they didn't get the, the memo that it was too cold and they shouldn't have survived in the leaf litter, but um, so you can delay planting of the beans. They are pests of soybeans, but uh, very big with garden beans, especially um, young plants. Um, so the, the Hope Garden kind of got a lot of damage. So one of the things we can do for both of these beetles some of the insecticides you can use, um, we'd start with like pyrethrins. Um, it would only be effective for probably a day. Um, then you can go to neem oil, which would last a couple days, and then spinosad would be a week. But we want to try to stay away from some of the more um, potent and toxic because we've got some really natural enemies that, and you could see um, there was a parasitic wasp that I watched um, lay its eggs into the eggs of the asparagus beetle. And so this is just an example of why we want to be really um, thoughtful and mindful in our use of pesticides because there's a lot of things out here and I think they parasitize 75% of the asparagus beetle eggs. So Perfect. something to know and something to, to think about. Thank you, Jody. Okay, Dennis. Okay. So we... <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about 13 line ground squirrels, and we, or just ground squirrels. Here's a couple of them here. And thanks to Jody's artfulness, they have googly eyes. As you can see, not in nature, but these particular stuffed ones have googly eyes. And these are the guys that like seed. Um, they actually uh, dig a hole, and 20 feet later, you have another hole with no dirt around it, and it's a perfect hole that a golf ball would fit into it. So, and they love it, well manicured lawns. The more well manicured, the better they like it. To capture them, you can make uh, a trap such as this out of hardware cloth. It's fairly easy. You put an end on it and then you make a flap out of a piece of hardware cloth and you can just diagonally put it over the hole and you pour water down there, they'll run up there and then they can't uh, go back on this or you can have the stabby little ends where it actually goes in and they, they'll come up and get caught in there. And so um, since they only have a one-way um, system, unlike a lot of other animals, if you pour water down the hole, they have to come up the other hole or that same hole, um, which moles and voles aren't that way, but these guys definitely are. And in case you're wondering, this is a Franklin's ground squirrel. 
Only found uh, in probably north central Nebraska uh, to the eastern edge of Nebraska. And he actually digs bigger holes and is not as prominent. So this is Franklin's ground squirrel, and these are two 13 line ground squirrels. Most of them are long and thin like this one. Uh, the students that stuffed this one <laughs> made, made this one a little obese, but he's a okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, won't, we won't say anything about that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, Amy, you have a, a large branch. I have a large branch. So we get a lot of questions about kinkers and trees. And so what I brought today, this is a honey locust out of my brother and sister-in-law's yard. Um, this tree was planted three years ago, so it's a fairly young tree. But within the first year, we saw the development of this canker, and you can kind of see there, it's a fairly large canker. And when we start looking at cankers, where do we see them on the tree and what is the impact? So this canker is on the main stem. This is on the leader of the tree. So this happened within one year after planting it. We are two years now down the road. And the amazing thing is as you start looking at this branch, the color looks fine, and then we get clear up here, it's a long ways away, and you see how that color changes. We have another canker developing, and that part of the tree is now dead. And so we're looking at a good foot, foot and a half from where the canker was at, now we have tree death. So what are we gonna do? Can we train a new leader? You can but you're gonna to have to cut below this canker. And then we always talk about how far do you have to cut back from a canker. And so the amazing thing is when we're cutting this tree apart, is we're able to see the discoloration already occurring in, in one of the branches. So my canker is right up here and I have discoloration. You see my hand here, my canker is here and my discoloration is already being found in this stem. And so that fungus is moving in and it's eating the heartwood of that tree, which completely degrades the stability of that tree long-term. So usually when we look at a canker, we're looking at six to eight inches below. But if you look at this, we're a good six inches from where the canker was actually seen. So by the time we would have actually pruned down to where we needed, there wasn't much of a tree left. So the best option sometimes with it's a little tree, rip it out and start over. And uh, just look for those cankers because this tree, if it was kept in the landscape, it maybe would have survived another five, four to five years probably, but it would never look the way they wanted it to look. All right, thanks Amy. Okay, John, Omaha got nailed and you've got a sample in your hand. Right, you know, four o'clock the other morning, heard a loud commotion outside and it was oh hail. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have some aftermath in the garden. So I picked this from in front of our extension office in Omaha. And as you can see, we now have you know a viewfinder uh, <laughs> through the leaves. Uh, this is hail damage on the hostas, but a lot of different plants got a lot of different damage. Um, you know, at my house, we had uh, dahlias that have basically been defoliated. Uh, luckily, the vegetable garden didn't have any damage. Um, and the planters that I brought the last time I was here the, with the beautiful lettuce and the pansies and all that, uh, now it's tossed salad all over the front porch. Oh boy. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so if you look at the plants and you got this hail damage, it really depends on the damage and the plant. So for these, I know it doesn't look very nice, but if you take all the leaves off that are damaged, you're not gonna have anything for the plant to photosynthesize and create energy to regrow. So you want to leave it unless it really looks like it's dying or has signs of disease. For trees, we had some trees, they lost a lot of leaves. Uh, you might see some branches and things start to die, but wait, don't go out and, and trim everything. Now, if you had some annuals, especially in the vegetable garden, uh, defoliation is fine, they'll usually come back, but I've heard some people that maybe like their, their pepper plants basically got cut in half. Uh, those probably aren't going to come back. The tomatoes might, but the other things you might have to replant but a lot of the garden centers around Omaha that didn't have their plants covered have said that they basically lost all of their plants. Yeah. So uh, there was lots of hail and I drove by piles of it that were like a foot deep in the streets in Omaha. It was crazy. Yeah, just exactly what we did not need. Yeah. But all right, thanks for that. Okay, so Jody, this first question is one from Hastings, Iris. What is wrong with them? And I know you and Amy batted this back and forth, and we actually talked about this a little bit last week, so. Yeah, so, well, when I, when I looked at this, I thought it was gonna be the iris borer because it's a, a bug question, but I think it might be uh, like a fungal leaf spot. Amy, I'm not 
pathologist, but right. it's like the spots and the, the rust color look. So the spots on that you're seeing on there really looks like iris leaf spot, which is caused by a fungus. Surprise, surprise, we've had so much moisture, we're seeing fungal leaf spots showing up. Um, the streaking doesn't necessarily line up with that, but then again, that could just be a stress relating component. Um, on the leaf spot side, we can you can treat with a fungicide, but typically the biggest thing is sanitation mm -hmm. and cleaning up those irises at the end of the year. And if it's iris borer, that's a huge component for you too, isn't it, Jody? Yeah, so there have been some caterpillars on, on irises. Um, actually, we've seen like cutworms and, mm -hmm. and budworms on them. And they're more of a, of a streak down the leaf. And like the iris borer actually can get to like two inches long. So it can be a pretty big caterpillar. And then you would find them like cut into the rhizomes um, to right, find so them So sanitation there. either way, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thank you for that back and forth. <laughs> All right, Dennis, uh, we had this one before, but we've got this one again from a different viewer in a different spot. This is near oh. Plymouth. They've seen them the last couple years. Uh, he thinks he knows what it is. What is it? It's Cope's gray tree frog. And Plymouth, Gage County, mm -hmm. uh, Saline County there towards uh, Jefferson County uh, cusp. They've been there forever. They are moving their way uh, West, uh, we find them now as far west as North Platte. Uh, with the suppression of fire, they're all along the Platte River corridor and the Niobrara corridor all the way to Valentine. Um, again, they cause no problems, they need insects, and they have a wonderful call. The males are the only ones that have vocal cords, and they're calling right now, so. Can you do it? Can we do I can't do that <laughs> really well. <laughs> Do they, do they know the phone number to call for the questions? Right, they're calling right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they have these big suction cups, so they have a hard time calling on the phone. Oh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Amy, this comes to us from uh, Panhandle, mm -hmm. and this is a, a stumper, but this is a spruce with black and brown things originating from the stems, working from the top of the tree down, killing the tree. Two others are near, are doing well, and these are not insects. So I know okay. you, you pathologists have looked at this. and So we've batted this one around a lot, and from the email conversations, it's supposedly jelly in, in texture. Um, as far as everything I've looked at, I can't find a disease that matches these descriptions. And so I would say we are 100% truly stumped. This is one that we definitely need to have sent in to Kyle um, at the Plant Pest Diagnostic Clinic. And it may be a situation where Kyle's actually gonna send it off to someplace else, um, to somebody who who is definitely a tree expert because it looks a little different. I mean, I even looked at, there's things called jelly fungi, jelly fungus. They're gelatinous and we'll see them on oaks and other hardwoods. I haven't been able to find any reports on spruce. So, and typically I don't see jelly fungi in the panhandle because you're typically not wet enough for that. Right. Um, so really stumped on this one, you're gonna need to send in a sample. All right, thanks Amy. <clears throat> All right, John, this is an Auburn Nebraska viewer who has strawberries that look like that as opposed to what they would expect the plants to look like. He's, they say a few flowers that look on plants that look normal but not really on this colony or this bunch here. What do you think? I say welcome to Jurassic Park. <laughs> um, so, so those are like giant strawberry shrubs mm -hmm. uh, which is totally not normal um, and I think there could be a uh, there are a few answers and none of them are like great answers. Uh, number one, it's the crazy weather. It's like we've had lots of moisture, we've had lots of actually good weather, like temperature wise for growing things like strawberry. So it could just be that they are very, very happy in the, the current climate that we have. Um, sometimes when we see a lot of leafy growth like that in plants, it could also be over fertilization with nitrogen, uh, where there's just so much nitrogen that it's really growing uh, really fast and really large. And that could also explain why there aren't as many flowers on them, because when you get all the green lush growth, it's at the expense of the flowers and fruit. And then uh, even another explanation could be some sort of mutation on that one plant that you know, would be caused by any number of factors. So there's a few explanations, but it's 
just weird. <laughs> okay, thanks, John. Well, you know, we get a fair amount of questions about earthworms causing problems in the turf. Turf, turf. <laughs> but for the most part, earthworms are beneficial and they need no control. However, they can make your yard lumpy if there are too many of them. So our first feature takes a look at earthworms. Here's Jonathan Larson to tell us more. Generally speaking, we like to have earthworms around. They're generally a good thing to have in the soil. Aristotle actually said that they're kind of the intestines of the earth. They're there to help us break down lots of material. They devour thatch as it accumulates in the lawn. They help to aerate the soil by making their tunnels as they wiggle through the dirt. And they're just generally something we want to have around. There are lots of different species that we can encounter here in North America. Not all of them are native to this part of the world. They were actually accidentally brought over when we started to colonize this part of the world, but they were released in ship bilge and then they got out. So you're not gonna see a lot of native American earthworms anymore, but the ones that we have have been around for such a long time that we kind of rely on them at this point. We can see night crawlers, we can see the red earthworm. There's lots of different ones out there. You may have heard about some invasive earthworms recently. We haven't seen a lot of problems with that in this part of the world, but they are something that we're keeping our eyes open for. That being said, if you have too much of a good thing, it can be a bad thing. So we get reports from people about their lawn being destroyed by earthworms. We see this on golf courses as well. And so if their populations get out of hand, then we can start to see damage. And that comes in the form of either middens or castings. So an earthworm midden is when something like a night crawler comes to the surface, their tunnel is at the top, it ends, and then they start to eat and they pull stuff towards their tunnel and they construct, it looks like a tower and it, ha it can have leaves in it, grass clippings, it can have seed pods from maple trees, lots of different kinds of stuff. The castings, that's more related to the other end of the earthworm, what comes out after they've digested it. The casting is basically their fecal material. When these things are constructed, it makes the soil lumpy. It can just drown out the turf in general. If they're squished by a mower, they can flatten out and become death for the grass itself. And they can also dull mower blades. So because of all that, sometimes people need to do things in order to control the earthworms. Now, that being said, there's not a actual labeled vermicide that's on the market. There are things out there that have side effects on them. Some insecticides like carbaryl and things of that nature can control them, but it's not labeled for that use. So we don't advocate for that. There is a product called early bird fertilizer. It is a chicken manure kind of mixture that has tea seed oil in it. And then when you put that on the turf, the grass is gonna benefit from the fertilizer and that tea seed oil seeps down in and it controls some of the earthworms. You're never gonna get them all. You're not usually gonna get the night crawlers because they're too far down in the soil. But if you pursue things like tea seed oil or other natural soaps, when those get into the soil, you are gonna see some control of those earthworms. So generally speaking, live and let live, live with those earthworms as they squirm around in your grass. But if they are causing some issues, then you can try and seek out some of those organic control products. For the most part, we do want you to leave those worms alone, but they can get out of hand when their population spikes. Maybe you can live with a lumpy turf or try some of the things Jonathan mentioned <laughs> or go fishing <laughs> or, or let all those small children go dig for worms because they absolutely love it. Go dancing for the worms. <laughs> exactly. Right. Garter snakes love them. I have a worm house. Or, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Perfect. All right, Jody, so you have a couple of oaks from a couple of people. Uh, Underwood, Iowa to begin with. These are, uh, this is a swamp white oak and has these large growths on the leaves. That's your first one. And he did that for us, cut one open, which is fabulous. What is that one? So they're actually both uh, oak apple gall. Mm -hmm. And the first one really does look like an apple. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how to name things creatively. So they're <laughs> apple galls. So what, um, you know, we do talk about galls a lot because they are very mysterious to people, but it's an insect that feeds on the plant tissue and it's the way the plant, uh, the plant's response. Mm -hmm. And so in each one of those is a Our wasp larvae um, developing water. and it will emerge um, as a full wa a wasp. There is <laughs> no concern and no, <laughs> uh, nothing to worry about, no treatment. It should not, I mean, 
shouldn't it's there's no damage whatsoever okay and the other one was from crescent iowa and we have some very weirdness going on that probably <laughs> can be heard on air it's a great tree frog <laughs> <laughs> i told you i find it oh, yeah. <laughs> so that is the crescent iowa yeah and apple. this is also <laughs> i get rid of it <laughs> And on that note, so that's the red. That's an, you those that is also an apple gall. Oak apple gall. All right, Dennis, yeah. behave yourself. <laughs> the second one here is uh, your picture you is help? actually. Can you get that off? Yeah, I can. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> So, this so that was a Cope's great tree frog. <laughs> Excellent. And unless they start calling when they're mating, they won't stop. <laughs> Brother. <laughs> okay, this is bat housing. This is from Omaha. Uh, these are great pictures, actually. He has up to 16 bats roosting behind the louvers in the garage, hanging onto window screens. Um, and then, of course, their bat guano filters through onto seed trays and other things. He's wondering if the guano is a health hazard, and he's wondering also, should he build a box deeper into the garage for more roosting purchase? You could, it, it sounds like they're just coming to get insects and they're not staying there all winter. As far as the droppings go, if the droppings are landing on the soil and a fungus is not growing and they're becoming part of the soil, they're a great fertilizer, uh, matter of fact, bat guano is sold as fertilization. Uh, the problem occurs when fungus grows in their droppings, usually in a moist attic, then you could get something like histoplasmosis, but that's not from the actually droppings themselves, it's from the fungus that grows on the droppings in a high humidity, uh, warm location. Um, I would just secure the fence behind so they can't get into the attic. And it seems like there's enough space there. They can double their colony slowly in that space. Um, I don't think you need to build anything else. I think they, they would just enjoy it. All right, awesome, excellent. All right, Amy, um, this is in Exeter, Nebraska. Question, has uh, one rose that is looking like this, and the ones on either side are fine. This is showing classical symptoms of rose mosaic virus. Mm -hmm. um, it, in some ways, it's really pretty, the pattern that, patterns that you do get. Um, once you get a virus in a rose, there's nothing you can do for it. Um, so to prevent the spread to the other roses, you need to pull the rose out and replace it with something else. But as you pull it out, um, I can't rem I'm drawing a blank on uh, transmission for rose mosaic, but any of your clippers, your shovels, anything like that, highly suggest that you wipe it down with a Clorox wipe or dip it in a 10% Clorox or alcohol. Um, hand sanitizer works too, to clean those up before you would prune your other roses because there's a potential that you can move that virus to your other roses and that's the last thing you wanna do. But best thing to do is rogue it out, which is Lauren's favorite thing to say. All right, thanks Amy. <laughs> All right, you have a couple of different, uh, name this shrub, um, and talk a little bit about both of them, John. So this person, we're not sure where this one's from, but it doesn't matter because it's everywhere. Right, so that is a honeysuckle or a lonicera, uh, and they're beautiful plants and they usually smell very beautiful. Uh, it's probably a volunteer from a, a bird planting. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with it is that it is very invasive. Mm -hmm. uh, it will basically take over wherever you allow it to grow uh, and will just keep spreading from the berries that the birds keep eating and it'll be all over the neighborhood. So the recommendation is actually to take that out as soon as possible. Uh, so you'll need to cut that back. You, may, you might have to use some sort of uh, herbicide on it to, to, to stop it because it is such a pervasive plant. You might have to do something like glyphosate uh, on there just to keep that from going. All right, and your second one is actually um, in Council Bluffs, and he had this one come up in his, in his garden bed. What's this one? So that one uh, actually looks, uh, it's a berry as well, it's elderberry, mm -hmm. uh, what it looks like to me. Uh, and so you've had some, some birds planting that. Uh, so if you want some elderberries, you leave it in, in place. If you don't want elderberries, uh, then you can Rogue it out. Mm -hmm. There you go. So. Right. Dig deep. Dig deep, right. Yeah.
Yeah, they're great plants, but again, the birds bring you many gifts. Yes. <laughs> All right, thanks, John. Well, it has been very wet here in Lincoln the past few days, and all that moisture is helping our garden get maybe too good a start in the growing season. But let's take a minute to hear from Terry James about what's happening in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we had all those master gardeners here helping us, and we have our whole garden planted. And it looks beautiful. Although our plants are small, we can definitely tell all that color in the garden is so refreshing to see. Remember, we're always making sure that our soil is good. So we planted everything, made sure that we hoed back out so we didn't have any compacted soils. And then we came back in with all the leaves that we saved from last fall, and that is our mulch now. So we are helping to keep all of the weed seeds from germinating and we are keeping all of those diseases that are already in the soils from splashing up onto our plants and possibly infecting it. We have a few spring stuff that's about ready to come out of the garden. So we're gonna start thinking about what we can plant seed wise for summers like the green beans, maybe a couple green beans, maybe some more squash to push us back further into the season. But stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out what's happening. Despite that rain, everything really does look great. We're off to a good start in our garden and looking forward to some sunshine and some warmth. All right, just some questions, Jody. Uh, this is a viewer who has a bumblebee type insect guarding the deck. Oh. About the size of a bumbly, mm -hmm. shiny black back section hovers. What is it and what to do about it? Yeah, that's a carpenter bee. And actually, I, I went in to, to help a friend with carpenter bees and I caught with a net 17 of them. Oh. So the one that's hovering is the male uh, carpenter bee. He's basically just waiting for the female to uh, to meet with her, but she's busy working and, and collecting pollen. So they are great pollinators, but over like subsequent years, they can cause significant damage to, to structures, um, especially untreated wood. So that's what that is. But that one is does not have a stinger. So you can catch that one, or you can, I guess, hit it with a fly swatter. Um, but you are gonna wanna try to plug up those holes before the fall so they don't overwinter in there. All right, thank can you. Can you just tell them to buzz off? Didn't work. I wanted them to go to my house, but they didn't. <laughs> All right, Dennis, this is uh, from Carney, and he's wondering how to discourage the many neighborhood cats from beneath his spruce trees, and talking to the owner of the felines didn't work. This is a difficult one. There, um, there really are no repellents that work on cats, and that defecation from cats is really toxic, more toxic than most mammals. Um, and so you definitely don't want that to happen. Um, if you put large rocks there, like, you know, that's probably not great for the tree, but if the cat cannot scratch and bury its defecation, it probably would go elsewhere. Other than that, you can lay <coughs> wire there, um, like chicken wire, and kind of so if the cat steps on it, its paws don't get caught, but they kind of, it feels very strange to the cat, and the cat may not go there. But once one cat goes there, or that cat defecates or urinates there, it will always come back um, because of that scent. So it's, and there isn't anything really to cover that up with. So it's a matter of, you know, stopping them from getting to that area where they smell it and where they can scratch. That, we will start the lightning round. I'm gonna win. Okay, <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> John, from Auburn, a northern red oak, the leaves are wilting, getting crispy. It's about four years old, it's looked good. Can it be too much water? It is too much water, you need to stop the rain. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, this is a cottonwood close to a cabin along the Platte River, was struck by lightning in that big storm. Should that come down? It should, because it cooked from the inside. <laughs> All right. Uh, a Columbus viewer wants to know why their iris has changed from purple and lavender to white. Could be that it had a mutation, a sport, or some sort of uh, fertilization. There's lots of different things that can happen there. All right. Is a concoction of one teaspoon of Epsom salts plus four cups of warm water beneficial for tomatoes? Just say no to Epsom salts. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> 
Uh, a Millard viewer wants to know, should all of the damaged foliage be pruned off from the hail? No, leave it. All right. Is there a way to identify old varieties of iris? Not, uh, you can look at the cultivar and look up how old they are, but nothing other than that. All right. The tops of asparagus got pruned off accidentally. Will that kill it? It will not because you prune it to harvest it. Okay. Nice job. Uh, wow. 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 Right? <laughs> yeah. I don't, see, let's I, see you. I don't stand a chance. All right. so <laughs> Path doesn't ever stand no, a chance. No, we don't. Are you ready, Amy? <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, this viewer wonders whether fire blight in choke cherry can be controlled by pruning it out. You can, but you need to prune it out 12 to 16 inches below where you see the symptoms. Good right. luck. Uh, can hail damage cause diseases on quaking aspen? This is an Omaha viewer. It can actually cause those cankers that I talked about because we wound the, the bark and it allows an opportunity for bacteria and fungi to move in. All right. Can anything be done about Cercospora leaf spot on Swiss chard? There are a few fungicides you could do, like a copper base, but most of the time I avoid it because of that restriction from spraying until you can harvest. All right. Um, how, how do you control powdery mildew in the turf? Cultivar selection. Oh, um, overseeding with the resistant cultivars is your best choice. All right. Apples are dropping yellow foliage already. This is a Grand Island viewer. What might that be? It could be too much water. Um, we are seeing some cedar apple rust already, but I would probably lean toward water. All right, nice job. Almost as nice as John. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dennis, you ready. ready? Yes. Are you behaving? Mm. Never. <laughs> <laughs> it was the frogs, it wasn't me. <laughs> this is a viewer in Humboldt who says they saw a large grayish snake. What would that be? Humboldt is probably the Great Plains rat snake. All right, rat, not rattle. Rat, not rattle. Okay, how can you keep squirrels from chewing on the flat branches of trees? It's tough, you can try something like a uh, hot sauce and vegetable oil on it, and if they really need it, they'll still do it. All right, uh, this viewer wants to know whether putting rocks in their containers on their deck will help keep the critters out of those containers. Depends on the critters and how big the rocks are. I mean, if it's toddlers, you need to be quite a big size rock. <laughs> okay. When can bats be excluded from a home? Is this the fly till Wait July? Till July, right. Let them fly till July. All right. There are swallows in the cliffs along the canyons in central Nebraska. What are those? Cliff swallows. <laughs> <laughs> How do you keep uh, animals from chewing on deck railings? That really, the caspianus or the hot sauce and vegetable oil really works on that. Okay, perfect. All right, nice job. Thanks. Sorted, behaved. All right, <laughs> Jody, you ready? Uh -huh. <laughs> we have a viewer who said they have seen very tiny, fast little red insects. What are those? Those are probably concrete mites. Okay, and how they do you feed on pollen? You, you can't control those. They're everywhere. Okay. <laughs> What might be eating holes in the ground cover called money wart? This is an Omaha viewer. If it's like buckshot holes, like really tiny shot holes, uh, probably uh, flea beetles. And control? Um, neem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, that was a strong answer. <laughs> um, what is the best grub control product to use right now? Um, well, it would probably be in June if they want a preventative, and Scott's Grub X, I think, is what is recommended. Is recommended. Okay. Um, Japanese beetle traps are being promoted. Yeah, don't yep. do it. Yep, no. Don't do it in a home. All right. Backyard. How do you treat scale on mugo pine? This is an ord viewer. Um, if they're crawler stage, you can treat it with horticulture oil. Otherwise, you can scrub them off. All right, nice job. Who won? It looks like it was John. Oh, it was me. Oh, finally. 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 So oh, John gets go. Congratulations. Go. Right. <laughs> and John also has to do the plant of the week. I have to see, I was so intent on winning that. You forgot. I forgot the plant of the week. There we go. Oh, All right. There we go. All of my stuff. <laughs>
<laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, two plants of the week, uh, as usual. So we have these uh, purple spiky and yellow spiky. This is one plant. This is Baptisia, so it's false indigo. And it is a variety or cultivar called Solar Flare. Uh, it's bred from two native species to create this. And the interesting thing is that it opens up this beautiful yellow color, and then as the flowers age, they turn orangey, and then this purple color. So it is very interesting, and so you get all those colors on the same plant at the same time. It's a very interesting plant. And then the other plant that we have here is called Golden Alexander. Uh, I like the scientific name, it's Azizia. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. It's in the carrot family, uh, and it likes, it can grow in moist areas, but Jody will find this interesting because it actually is a host for swallowtail butterflies mm. larvae. So you can have it in the garden and get your swallowtails too. So I don't have to buy parsley. You don't have to buy Sorry. parsley. You can plant this for them. <laughs> exactly, and it's perennial. And those are both in the backyard farmer garden. So if people want to come this weekend and take a peek, mm -hmm. they are both in full glory pending any more rain or water. Hail. Or hail, no. which we did not get. <laughs> All right, Jody, uh, your next ones are actually some interesting holes in, in living objects. The first is a tree that is a honey crisp apple and has a pretty big hole in it. Any ideas on that one? Okay, so it that doesn't look like an emergence hole from one of the boring beetles, but it could be a boring beetle is in there and a bird or a woodpecker is trying to get at it. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you say apple tree? Yeah, so it, Chris, yeah it yeah. might be like a flat headed apple borer, but it doesn't look like the right size hole. All right, so really nothing to do at this point um, on that one. Yeah, it's not a very healthy variety to have, right? Right. <laughs> okay, and then our, your second one is a, uh, a pin oak, and she f she found this this guy in it and wonders whether what it is and do they need to do anything yeah, so, about it. So this is really interesting, um, and it's a really great picture. Thank you. Um, okay. It looks like a flat-headed borer, so it's in the same uh, beetle family as like the emerald ash borer. So they're metallic, really pretty beetles as adults. But um, as larvae, they will, you know, bore into the wood, and it looks like they pretty much girdled that tree. So I don't know if that branch um, looked really bad before it, was, it fell off, but um, there's not really a lot you can do with it. If you see more branches like that, you could probably take those down um, and just try to increase the vigor of that tree. All right, thanks, Jody. Pretty interesting when little insects. Yeah. And there's about 25 different, uh, like, species of like flat-headed boars, so hmm. could be a number of them. Oh boy. All right, Dennis, yes. this is a pasture in Oto County, yeah. and she says there are 40 to 50 of these holes, six inches in diameter and six to eight inches deep. They're very shallow, so what do we so think? So it's a insectivore, carnivore mammal digging for food. Uh, could be a raccoon, going after grubs or earthworms. It could be a skunk. Those almost look more skunk-like. It's too big to be an opossum. So I would go with the uh, raccoon or the skunk. And not much you can not do. Not much you can do, yeah. Wow, interesting. And it's because they're shallow that you know they're yeah, not. Yeah, and, and it looks like bare ground, so it's, it's easy for them to get to the insects, and that's why they're going after the bare ground. All right. Once something starts to grow on it, they probably won't be able to too much. Okay, thanks. Um, Amy, this is a viewer who had the same issue with her hydrangeas, and they're the big leaf hydrangeas. She had this last year as well. Uh, she's in Omaha. Plants face south, but they get good direct sun, and they get this black on the foliage. What is this, and is there anything that can be done about it? So, we have a few different leaf spots that occur on uh, hydrangea. I would probably lean to more like a botrytis or an anthracnose type fungal infection. Once again, it's because of the high moisture that we're, we've been receiving. Best thing you can do is you can come in with a contact fungicide, a copper base, Bordeaux, and treat that hydrangea just to provide some protection. If you are using one of those products or contacts, and whenever we get a rain event, it washes off and then you have to respray. Um, there may be some systemics available out there, but I don't I can't recall any that are labeled for hydrangeas at the moment. I know those copper blends work just fine on them. Um, if you are using the copper though, I will warn you, do not spray the copper 
on any plant if we get really hot temperatures above 75, 80 degrees uh, in the heat of the day because the coppers will actually burn the foliage and then you have more brown leaves and green leaves. So you want to spray coppers typically in early evening when it isn't as warm. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, this is a papillion viewer. And John, they have several large rock beds with plantings and trees in them. So this is just one example. She's wondering what she can use to keep out the crabgrass and the weeds. So it's both a get out and then a keep out. Right. So looking at this, there could be some crabgrass in there, but I'm wondering, um, it also looks like uh, some nut sedge in there as well, which could happen because the, the rocks are compacting the soil, but also we've had so much water uh, that those are, when we have heavier soils, we get those. Uh, so if that is what it is to control that, there are some, there's a chemical called halosulfuron, uh, or you can call it um, sedge hammer mm -hmm. uh, is a fun product name. Uh, but looking at the bed, there are some things that you can do. So you could use a pre-emergent if it's crabgrass or other weeds uh, to do that. But looking at the bed, so the rocks are big rocks, but there's lots of space between them. So that allows the weeds to come up. So using something finer, so either some finer rocks in there or switch to, to like a wood chip mulch uh, would be better to control the weeds. Uh, hand pulling those, you know, once you get them, that's one thing that you can do. Um, there are some like grass be gone like things if there are some grass like weeds in there as well. So take a look at that. Also planting that a little more densely. So we had big open spaces with not a lot of plants in there. So the more shaded and the more covered that ground is, the less likely you are going to have weeds growing. Perfect, thank you, John. Well, you know, many gardeners like to try their hand at growing asparagus. It's true they can take a while before they hit their stride, but once established, they can produce for decades. Let's take a few minutes to hear from Kathleen Q with some important management tips for asparagus. Asparagus has been cultivated for centuries. And why not? I mean, the tasty spears are really wonderful and gardeners love it because it's easy to grow, relatively worry-free, and it's a perennial crop, meaning you don't have to fuss with all of the annual crops year after year. Asparagus is a dioecious species, meaning that they're separate male plants from female plants. The male plants tend to live longer and they produce more over time. The female plants have bigger spears, but they also produce the red berries that then can seed themselves into other locations. They also tend to be slightly shorter lived. Of the varieties of asparagus that we can grow, Mary Washington, Martha Washington, and Waltham Washington are three varieties that have been around for a long, long time. When you're choosing a spot for your asparagus plants, make sure you pick a location that's full sun. Keep in mind that asparagus can live for 15 or more years in a given location. So if you're siting it in a place that's close to trees, that may be a problem somewhere down the line. So site it in a full sun location and work that soil so that it's nice, deep, and loamy. So if you have sand or lots of clay, you'll wanna work some compost into the site to really free up that soil and make it good to work in. Dig a trench about six to eight inches deep and about 12 inches wide, and you'll plant the plants as crowns at the bottom of that trench and cover them with about two inches of soil. As the plants grow, you can fill in more soil around the plant and gradually have it so that it's at the same grade as the rest of the soil over time. Whenever you're thinking about uh, weed control with this particular plant, then you have to be careful with cultivation. So if you're cultivating, you have to be careful with that your cultivator doesn't hit the roots or the crown at all. If that happens, you could accidentally kill the plant. The other thing that you can have is asparagus beetles. And asparagus beetles are something that can cause bending or twisting of the plant. So be mindful of those as well. When harvesting, you really want to look at the size of the spear itself. So when the spear is less than pencil size, so pencil size or less, 
you really don't want to harvest those. You want them to go ahead and fern out like they're supposed to. But the ones that are bigger than that, bigger than pencil size, are still ones that you can harvest. And there's two schools of thought on that. You can either give it a gentle bend until it snaps from the parent plant, or you can use a knife and cut the asparagus from there. And when most of the plant planting has either pencil size spears or smaller, that's the time when you stop harvesting from it and you allow it to recoup throughout the rest of the growing season. So if you haven't grown asparagus before, give it a try. Our long spring this year has made it a wonderful addition to the garden and they're so easy to grow. If you're considering getting started with asparagus, talk to your extension educator or one of us about the best cultivars. The males actually are more productive, so that's one thing to look at in the name for the cultivars. I do love me some asparagus, mm -hmm. and I buy mine at Farmer's Market. It's easier. <laughs> All right, Jody, your uh, picture here is from rural Oto County, and they've just noticed these little critters on their prairie sage plants. They wonder what they are and anything to worry about. Okay, so the funny thing is, is that this couple was in the office the other day. We just ran into each other by chance because I was there, and I'm not usually. And I told them that I thought that it was a question mark butterfly, but now that I know that it's prairie sage and did a little bit of research and it's, is it the Asteracea mm -hmm. family? Mm -hmm. So this is actually a painted lady uh, mm -hmm. butterfly caterpillar. Um, I zoomed in and I cannot see the spikes on its head and that's what is the question mark or Eastern comma. And so it's gonna turn into this um, painted lady so it's um, orange oh, orange and black with white spots. Um, they are migratory, actually. And um, if you see the leaf, another clue was that I could see um, it, the larvae rolls up into a leaf and um, pupates in there. So I led you astray. But I wanted to let you know that this is, um, there's some really good books that focus just on caterpillars, which are always very hard to identify. So a caterpillar field guide, and then I have like a butterflies of the Midwest. So these are my two favorite things. Perfect. All right, Dennis, yes. um, this, is, this is a great picture. Uh, picked up on the street, and she, she has a comment about the projectile pee of a turtle, but she also says, who is the hitchhiker? And she's calling him an Uber driver. So what is, so what well, is the turtle? It, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a painted turtle, and the hitchhiker is a leech. Um, painted turtles get leeches, and that's why they, lots of times why they bask, especially snapping turtles. They don't usually bask unless they get leeches, and they try to dry them off by basking. <laughs> it's not projectile urine. They have two bladders they hold water with to carry. It's like they're canteens. Uh, and also the female uses those to line the whole water before she lays eggs. And so you just got the water that they're carrying in their lymph glands or bladders. It's not what you think it is. Well, Same thing with toads. It's, it's not urine, it's just water. You can perfect. drink it. Do you really want it to? <laughs> yeah, no. no. <laughs> really, no. Yeah, no. Okay. All right, Amy, this is a, uh, a viewer who has a small shagbark hickory, mm -hmm. uh, bottom land along the Missouri by Decatur, wasn't flooded. He's seen several of these that seem to be getting the black on the leaves. And so any ideas, he thought maybe it might be environmental because they do seem to grow out of it, but they seem to do this kind of every year. So with nut trees, we can get leaf anthracnose that can develop. And a lot of times we'll see that fungal growth along the veins of the leaf because that's where the water is going to collect. Typically, we don't recommend a treatment for it. However, these are smaller trees that you're trying to get established. If you're seeing an increased rate of anthracnose, a use of a basic fungicide as a protectant, could help those trees just to make sure you have enough foliage to get them well established. But once the trees are established, it's typically not a major concern. Mm -hmm. And sanitation, clean up the leaves at the end of the year. All right, thank you, Amy. This is an Omaha viewer, John. Uh, their neighbor has this particular plant growing in the backyard and he cuts it down every fall and it comes right back every spring. Extremely invasive. Do we know what this is and how to get rid of it? 
So that is actually a very fascinating plant. Mm -hmm. uh, it is prehistoric uh, and <clears throat> it is hard to control. Num there are two reasons. Number one, it does not have leaves. Uh, so typically when we use a, a fun uh, with a, a herbicide, we spray it on the leaves and that's the easiest way to get it on the plant. It's also a very thick waxy cuticle on there. So most of our uh, pesticides that we use are water-based. Mm -hmm. uh, and so using something like glyphosate, the glyphosate just rolls right off of it. Um, so it's, it's equisetum, they call it horsetail, or you can also call it scouring rush, because mm -hmm. it actually has silicone in it, so much so that uh, early pioneers would dig it up to use as like pan cleaners, like to, to scrub your pans with. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to control. Uh, you can dig it out, but its roots go like six feet deep, uh, <laughs> and it also spreads by spores, uh, and so you can just keep uh, digging it out. You can also use that product that I talked about with the, the nut sedge, uh, the halo sulfuron, actually can control it some. So doing that, pulling it out, keeping it cut, uh, or enjoying it. Those are your <laughs> options. Exactly. All right. Thank you, John. Well, we have announcements of fun things going on in the gardening world, and I believe we start first with the Monument Valley Iris Society annual Iris show and sale, June 1 and 2, Panhandle Research and Extension Center in Scotts Bluff. That's always a beautiful place. Uh, Western Nebraska wildflower events, all sorts of them, and we actually have a uh, website on air so you can go and see what's going on out in that part of the state. We have the Monroe Meyer Guild 51st Garden Walk in Omaha, June 9th from 9 to 4, uh, with a, a number to be able to call. And of course, then we, Backyard Farmer, are on location June 3rd, 5.15, Q&A, 6 p.m., and that's mountain time, taping at Bayside Golf Club in Brule. And yes, indeed, it is open to the public. The weather will be perfect and so will we. So, you know, if you can't get enough of Backyard Farmer, we really like to invite you to watch our new Facebook series called Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. We discuss important horticultural topics. We talk to all sorts of experts for tips and solutions that you can watch on our Facebook page. Coming up this Sunday, we're going to be talking about all of the great produce you can get at your local, farm, local farmer's markets. So do be sure to watch Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer on the Backyard Farmer Facebook page or any T's Facebook page this Sunday, 6.30 Central. I hear that it's a phenomenal episode. It is, John, right. and I wonder why, <laughs> <laughs> since you are on it. <laughs> All right, we have just a minute or so, so a question or two. Jody, this is an Omaha viewer, has little tiny black ants that are outside. Is that, are, and it seems like more than usual this year. Are you seeing that? In um, it's sort of an annual thing, and if they're outside, they're actually pretty beneficial. Just leave them, them be. Let they them be. eat the sugars them. from plant feeders or sap sucking insects, and they, I don't know, eat caterpillars. And they're outside. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Jody. Uh, this is a Gearing viewer, okay. and they have a. They think it's a cat using the garden for a litter box. Um, feces is yellow and always covered up with dirt in a very large sort of pile. Is, does that sound like a cat? It sounds like a domesticated animal if it's yellow because you, they get that color from the color they put in the domesticated animal food. If it was a raccoon also buries its scat, but a raccoon would have berries in it and it wouldn't be colored, it'd be very dark. So I'm saying it's a cat. And then we go back to the last question where you can put rocks or put fence over it or something along those lines. All right, uh, Amy, in about 20 seconds or less, we have mm -hmm. people still asking about cedar apple rust on cedars, too late to do anything, right? Too late to do anything on cedars. Um, depending on where you're at on the state and where your apples are at, you might be able to get a little bit of protection with a fungicide on your apples, but they'd have to be some really late apples. All right, thanks, Amy.